Let's say our blessing together. Baruch Praise to you, Lord of God, rule the universe, who's made us holy with your commandments, and commanded us to busy ourselves with the words of Torah. So, bringing up the source sheet. So, We'll begin with a joke. I think tonight I'll do the reading. Uh, who are the three cowboys of Adon Olam? They are Billy Rashid, Billy Kachid, and Kid Ruchi. Oh. <laughs> so, on one foot, Adon Olam. Uh, Adon Olam is a prayer about God at the beginning of the weekday morning service and the end of Shabbat in the festival morning service. It is attributed to Solomon Ibn uh, Gabriel, um, though some think it was written by Sharira Gaon or his son, Hai Ben Sharira Gaon. The piyut, the liturgical poem, started to become popular in the 1400s. So I call this on one foot, um, as I've been calling all of my summaries lately, because of the Talmudic story of the man who came to, um, who came to, um, sorry, Shammai, and said, Take, teach me the Torah while I'm standing on one foot and I will convert to Judaism. Shammai said, you're making fun of us, go get out of here, placed him out. And then the man came to Hillel and said, teach me the entire Torah while standing on one foot. And Hillel said, sure. So one of them stood on one foot and um, Hillel said, what you don't want to, people to do to you, don't do to others. The rest is commentary, now go and study. And so since this story, which is found in Masachet and Tractate Shabbat of the Talmud, um, the Jewish way of saying in a nutshell is on one foot. So that was, this paragraph is explaining it on, on, on one foot. Um, now I'll read the text in English and then we'll jump into some questions. Master of the universe who reigned before any creature or creation was created, at a time, at the time when all was made according to God's will, then ruler, God's name was called. And after all things shall cease to be, the awesome one will reign alone. God was, God is, and God shall be in glory. God is one or unique, and there is no second or peer to compare, to join God. Without beginning, without end, power and dominion are God's. The Lord is my God and my ever living redeemer, the rock of my destiny in times of distress. God is my miracle and my refuge, the portion of my cup on the day I call, which means he answers me. Into God's hand I entrust my spirit, both when I sleep and when I awaken. And if my spirit leaves, God is with me, I shall not fear or be afraid. So that's what we're saying when we sing Adonoam. Context, this is the text to Adonoam. First question, what reactions do you have to this text? Oh, yeah, I can't check it. We'll start at the beginning. Reactions. It's much deeper than you would think because of the light tunes, they always go with it. Hmm. I mean, so obviously, so it's far more profound when you're actually reading what it is you're saying. It's, it's like, okay. Yeah. I think sometimes it doesn't get appreciated because it's the end of the service and it could be a two and a half hour service, three hour service and people anxious to have lunch and you know, whatever the case may be. So I don't think you, you tend to dwell on it the way you may dwell on when we read the Torah or the Amidah or you know, the Devar Torah or something like that. So I think seeing it in this context, David, is very helpful. Hmm. Other reactions? Where all think... things shall cease to be. Does that include whatever the afterlife contains? 
Um, I'm going to go with no. I think it's after all things shall cease to be in this life. But it's a fair question. Was that Naomi that was also trying to I speak? I say that there are numerous descriptions of God here. Mm -hmm. Different definitions. Hmm. But it creates a really good feeling that something is always going to be there, that God will always be there. There's no beginning, no end. It's just there, and it's a very comforting feeling. Yeah. I'm surprised by the references to death and dying, and that's all things that used to be and begin at the, at the last two lines. Uh, I never thought of it containing anything to do with death because when we sing it, we're usually happy and uh, not in a contemplative mood with that part of the service, which is happy. And we usually sing it in a very joyful way. So, as, and if my spirit leaves, dies with me, I shall for not. That's our last, the last thing we say. And I would, don't really like the idea of saying that is the last thing I say. Mm. But, that's the last thing I'll be doing. Yeah. That's also a comforting thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Art scroll usually. Um, it, it looks like there are. Um, two sections uh, I don't know on the, the and it looks like the first one is about God and the second is about my relationship to God mm. and then, you know and and you can almost you can see where the division is yeah in the Hebrew uh, <laughs> that breaks out at the who the go the Lord is my God my ever living redeemer begins the second half of it it's a good observation all right next question we've done this a little bit already but what questions do you have about this text that the text is a personal God to an individual. Not talking about the God of mankind or even the God of all the Jews or Israelites. It's talking about my God it will be with me. He will be with me when I pass away. It was my cup, etc. Do you see that in both the first half and the second half? Uh, no, the first half looks like it's more universal, but it's not, it still seems to have a limitation of things. I can't put my finger on it. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> Great. Other questions? In a way, because this is the last thing we do in the service, it has you leave with a good feeling about God mm. and that you're not alone. Yeah. I think compared to other um, parts of our liturgy, uh, this reading tends to um, be very spiritual about God because I mean, I think some of our other prayers try to make God more with human qualities. Uh, hmm. 
even the Kedusha, you know, you're thinking of, you know, the angels standing and all that and, and, and giving God more of that. I think this is more just pure God of the spiritual, God as very immortal, um, that sort of thing. So I think that's what impresses me about uh, these lyrics, this lyric. Mm. Other questions? All right. Why would we end a service like this? You see, why would we end a service like this? Yeah. I mean, that was a comment that I had made about that you leave with that feeling that you're not alone, that God is with you. Mm. Yeah. At least for me, that's how I feel. Absolutely. Because we're ending uh, the Shabbat service with the Don Alam, but as you mentioned in your introduction, weekday services begin with the Don Alam. So then I guess the question could be, why would we start a service with these words, uh, six out of seven days of the week. That is the next question. I'll take <laughs> answers. To, I'll take answers to either now. Jump ahead. <laughs> I'm the plan. I'm the plan. Or why begin? Uh, it could be the introductory to to what the essence of what our precepts are, and also a conclusion to remind us to take it with us after we we conclude on uh, Shabbat. Yeah. Is it also saying that when we leave, is also saying that into the service when we leave, we are alone as far as other human beings, and the only accompaniment we have is God? Mm. So that after, after you've been with other people in the service, then you leave the service in your on your own again. And and yet, even when you feel like you're on your own, God is with you. Basically what you're trying to say here, or what you're saying? That's what I'm trying to say, but I guess my question is, why are you leaving without other people? Hmm. I mean, it is Shabbat, and traditionally you've been told that's the time you visit with other people. That's the time you study with other people, if you will. Uh, but this doesn't speak of that at all. This says go home alone and you're with God and your own thought, if you will. Where do you see that you go home alone? Uh, let's see. God is with me, I shall not fear be afraid. It just basically is, everything is individual. Hmm. I trust my, to God's hand, I trust my spirit when I sleep, when I awaken, which by the way, should that be awaken or when I am awake? But only when I wake up, but then he leaves me for the rest of the day. Hmm. If my spirit leaves, God is with me, I shall not fear or be afraid. It's, it just yeah. seems like it's the two people, it's the two entities leaving alone, me and God. Hmm. And God may not be there after I wake up. There are some people that are leaving alone. And so that is a comforting thing to have God. I mean, some of us can go home with someone else or go to I some sleep house. I sleep in my wake. Could it be that it is? Oh, sorry. No, I was going to say, I think this is particularly, um, was particularly relevant in the early months of COVID because I know in at Anshiyam at the service of that, I mean at Apollo, but the service at that time was Rabbi Siegel and Cantor Mitzrahi on the Bima, literally alone, and people in their own homes, at that point most people were alone. So the fact that you were, so you had that structure for two hours on Shabbat morning where you might have felt 
some sort of community, even though not the way we always knew it. And then when that was over, there was no kiddish, there was no lunch, there was no singing around the table. There was no Birkat Amazon. You were just literally on your own. So this is reassuring that you had God with you, that you weren't alone. So, you know, I know that's almost a little negative, but I guess um, I'm trying to take this, you know, not out of the traditional, but just uh, it's reassuring, I guess. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I think um, this that I got from this little portion that was mentioned uh, is that it seems to be emphasizing God's universal sovereignty in all places and in all situations. Maybe. Mm -hmm. As it talks about when I wake up, when I sleep, you know, at all times is kind of like the, the, what I think is being said. Mm -hmm. So whether it's night or day, he's always, uh, his sovereignty continues. His authority, you know, remains. Yeah. No, he, was before, yeah. he was before everything else and he'll be there after everything, uh, is um is everything else is gone that's eternity yeah. more than eternity and i read that the first time in english that uh, that really struck me because i've been singing this for for decades just in hebrew just almost mechanically and you read it and it's it's to me it was a it was a revelation see what exactly the depth and the 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 the, the everlasting the continuum of this in this universe and to me it was amazing that somebody well now i see in 1000 uh, a common era without the same ability to understand and see what we see we sense or our scientific measurements was so they still maintain that that vision it's uh, the essential philosophy right there the core of uh, what um, abraham saw who knows what else it, there was this it's not it's it's not an idol it's it's not somebody that has it's something out of clay it's something eternal and ever encompassing whatever it is or, or what the, that uh, particular spirit or whatever it is i don't know how to, that's that was my impression well, I don't know if any of you ever heard this, but as a child, I was taught to say, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. My mother used to make me say that every night. I said that too, Norma. What? I said that too. Oh, you, you had the same mother. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And that's what this reminded me of. In the could that be by any chance it's like an anecdote might that be a variation of the bedtime shema i'm not sure it sounds familiar i think it might be part of it i know it's something like it is in sidor sim shalom i think oh. mm -hmm. well and some of it is like the psalm you know i it's like some of the psalms that we say I shall, you know, I shall fear no evil, for God is with me. In the twenty-third Psalm. I, I, I have a question. I'm just curious. Um, I was wondering before there was a Don Alum, how did the service end? Oh, uh -huh. Good question. <laughs> I'm going to guess that it ended with the Mourner's Cottage, the way that a weekday service does. And that was it, nothing else? Hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I wonder. But that's my guess. Actually, in a Chabad service on Shabbat, they do not do a Don Alum. They end with the um, Helam, I think, or they, they do like the 20th Psalm or something, Psalm 20, but they don't sing it and they, there's no Don Alum. And Chabad tends to be more traditional, correct, with um, ritual? Not necessarily traditional. They they tend to they tend to have their way of evolving the service. Right. So I was just curious because I mean that's that's you know because I mean most other services yeah. of, the, of the other denominations end with the Don Alam, but Chabad definitely does not. Right. Uh, Chabad, so I was just Chabad, yeah, it's a it's an interesting information point about a Don Alam. Um, Chabad 
is part of the Hasidic movement, um, which dates back to the 1700s with Israel Ben Eliezer, known as the Baal Shem Tov. Um, so by the time that the Hasidic movement was in place, Adon Olam was definitely a thing. Um, so, so it's not like the Yemenite community um, having split off from the rest of the Jewish community and thus preserving um, more ancient ways of pronouncing Hebrew um, in their geographic isolation for so many centuries. Um, Chabad evolved after Adon Olam was already in place. So their choice to not end with Adon Olam was a reaction to it for whatever reason that I don't they know. End with, we, they end with Al Altira. Mm. So it's kind of the same thought, it's just in a different way. Yeah. But you have no, no fears, God's with you. It's just, a, it's, it's a different way of saying the same thing. Well, do most congreg conservative congreg congregations end with a Don Olam on Saturday morning? Or is yes. it up to, it is, okay. Because on Friday night, we do Yigdal usually. Right. Some synagogues though, do a Don Olam on Friday night. Do they? Well. Yeah, but some conservative ones do. I wish we would. <laughs> and I'm I know hard time with um, Yigdal. <laughs> Yeah, we don't like the holidays. Uh, reform tends to end the uh, Shabbat morning service with Ain Elohim. Like we do it at the end of Musaf. Uh -huh. But when I've gone to reform, that is, you know, after morning is Kaddish and all that stuff, then they do uh, Ain Elohim. You know, it, hmm. I don't know long, maybe on a Friday night or maybe on or something like that, more on a special occasion. So if you guys were doing, were getting to decide how the service should end, would you end with it or not? I would. <laughs> Saturday morning service, well, to be clear. To be clear. Yeah. I, I, I vote for that. <laughs> how about you? you like it, Howard sure. votes for that too. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> I do too. Thanks. <laughs> I mean, it's hard. It's hard to imagine ending a service with anything else. Yeah. We're so used to it. Considering right? how long it, we've been doing it, <laughs> but also it's a. I mean, it's an interesting tune because we can put it to so many other melodies. Right. That's it. So it's kind of a fun. You know, it's a. It's an not just what it says, but how we can sing it. There's a lot of potential variety, um, which mm -hmm. makes it fun. Do you remember, Alan, when there were a lot of bar mitzvahs when some of the parents would make up their own melodies for a don't know long? And Stuart didn't mind, he let them do it. There were a few parents, you know, who were musical and they put it to their own. And oh, okay, I, I don't remember, but that sounds like yeah, it was a long time ago, but it was when uh, Harold Brindell was there. And actually a couple of uh -huh. times with Stuart. <clears throat> but I think when that happens, it's a kind of a whimsical way to do things and it gets away from these words. Because I said before, because I always think of the, the, the lovely melodies we use and the ones that are appropriate to certain seasons of the year. And seeing this, you know, it's very powerful, as I said earlier tonight, seeing this in the English, uh, just with the words, is very powerful. And I think so many times, I you know, for myself, when the service ends, it's upbeat because maybe, you know, that melody of the Don Olam is an upbeat one. And sometimes I'm leaving the shul humming it to myself and whatever, like you would after a Broadway show. But now I'm gonna look at it differently after seeing these words, to be honest with you. But actually, the service doesn't end with the Don Olam at Har Zion. The rabbi busts the, busts the congregation after Don Olam. So really it goes from something very happy to something that's a little bit more solemn. Yeah. I think as much as we say different alternatives, I think the mainstream Jewish population would miss it if we didn't do it one way or the other. I mean, yeah, you can add all the things that I mean, sometimes they'll do uh, Kiddush and Motzi from the pulpit. So that'll be after Don Alam, or there might be, you know, a closing pages of the word Benedict, but that's what it really amounts to. Um, that's kind of Christian, but uh, but I think it's such a vital part, it's such an integral 
integral part of the service. Do the do the do the do the Sephardim? I know they use it in some services. Do they use it to end the service? I don't know. I know that it, at Chabad services with with the different sidur, they don't end with it. They somehow manage to end the service, although it takes a long time. So, I don't know if they use it to end a service. I would guess yes. Um, I do know that it is a longer version of it on um, for Sephardim. Um, there are extra verses in there in the middle. Um, and further down on the source sheet, um, there's a YouTube video where you can see the words and hear someone singing a Sephardic, a Sephardic tune um, for, all the, for all the words. Um, for those that are interested. Um, but that's a good question. May I ask, uh, uh, I may have make a little footnote to a Norma's interesting point about, uh, about her uh, childhood experience. Uh, so I looked it up because it sounded like a, well, it's, it's very much a, a Christian prayer that I'd heard as a, a myself, although not in Christian homes and see many of them. Uh, but I see that in the early 18th century, in exactly those words, at least that first uh, verse or the first stanza, uh, was in the um, the New England primer. So children were learning it in the uh, in the Puritan schools. Uh, schools uh, mm -hmm. uh, only you know at that time. Now I lay me down to sleep. Those uh, at least that, at least that first stanza. I don't know about the fourteen angels or the other settings of the thing. Yeah, cool. Thank you yeah. for looking it up. It's out there. I have a question. Where yeah. did the order of the services come in from in the first place? Where did the order of the service come from? In other words, like every show, every synagogue, every mm -hmm. with the exception of one, every sitter I've seen has pretty much the same order of prayers. Mm -hmm. So when you're asking, can this go? Is this in the right place? Do we have, so is there a preordination as to this goes here, this goes there, the monopoly piece goes here, the monopoly piece goes there? Yes. Um, so, so there is. Um, the, it says in the Torah that we should say the Shema when you lie down, when you rise up. So that's not like communal prayer, but I would say that might be the first, like say these words at this time example, or one of the first. Um, as far as when the serv the way the service is laid out, um, that's in the Mishnah. Um, the very first tractate of the Mishnah is Brasho, blessings. Um, and in one of the, one of the early chapters, maybe chapter, either chapter one or two, um, it says that we say, when we say the Shema in the morning, we say two blessings before and one blessing after, I believe. And when we say the Shema in the evening, we say two before and two after. And then I believe the Mishnah explains which ones they're talking about. Certainly the Gemara goes into it. Um, so there's already some some order or an indication as of the year 200 ish CE. Um, the first seder, which is a Hebrew word that means order, like the word seder, because um, prayers in a seder are in order, um, are uh, the first seder is from the 800s. Um, and it's response to a question from Spain asking what order should we say our prayers in? Like we know what Rabban Gamliel said around the year 100 in the Mishnah, um, Gamliel II, but like what order are we supposed to say all these prayers in? So they write to the Babylonian community and um, Rav Amram Gaon sends back a super long letter called a responsa, since it's in response, um, in 865, 
which is basically the world's first pseudo -R. Um, and then there are a few more early versions of the pseudo -R after that. Um, I think Sadia Gon might have also had an early one a, a century or two later, but basically everything follows from Amram Gaon in 865. Um, and so there's a structure to the service, like there's a warm up section, which can be super long and about morning and a sentence in a weekday evening. Um, and then we have Barthu in the morning, the evening, we have a creation prayer, a rev uh, thanking God for creating the world, a revelation prayer, thanking God for redeeming, revealing the Torah to us. Um, then we have the Shema um, and its paragraphs. Then we have a redemption prayer, um, thanking God for redeeming us from Egypt. In the evening, then we have Hashki Venu, helping, asking God to keep us safe at night. And then we have the Amidah. After the Amidah, there's a cool down period, which uh, at Mincha is Kadishoim, Oenu, and, and Mars Kaddish. And on Shabbat morning, the cool down period is the Torah mm -hmm. service in Musaf. Um, and ending with the, the closing parts of the Musaf service in Kalahinu, Oenu, I don't know, um, um, and some Kaddishes in between. So did uh, the master follow the order of the Siddur, or was that something separate entirely? It follows the order of the Siddur. Um, it has the same structure. Um, the, the service, the, um, the Amida is longer in the middle, um, on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, um, but Shachrit follows the same structure as the Shabbat Shachrit. Um, Konidre follows the same structure as a weekday, as a Shabbat and festival evening service, except with a longer warm up period um, and a longer Amida um, and a repetition of the Amida with the Sleikot section added on Yom Kippur. Um, we do add PUT and liturgical poems on the high holidays um, in, in, throughout the service. Um, but there's but it's basically the same thing, um, just with more things added in and changing the words to reflect the, the themes of the day. I have a related question um, to the Siddur development. Um, so did, did, did Siddurim of any kind essentially not exist before the 850 CE? I'm wondering because there were already synagogues you know, in, 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 the, in the land of Israel um before this so i would assume that they whoever was leading the minions in those synagogues had to have something for some kind of prayer structure so would they have just used some type of early minhag for something like that like early custom for for that did they just follow did they kind of just organically follow um some kind of of order based on what the Mishnah was saying you needed to say for prayers? How did it, how would it yeah. have worked? Yeah, um, that's a good question. So before the first Siddur, what did they say during services for 800 years since the temple was destroyed? Um, and basically the Mishnah and the Gemara lays out, here are the themes of the prayers. Um, but each person got to like make up their own their own riff on that theme. Um, and then when it when we had the first Sidor, people were like, ah, I guess those are the words we should use. So they use those words. Um, and then more things got added as the source developed. Like Kabbalah Shabbat wasn't a thing um, until the Kabbalists invented it in Svat in the 1500s. Um, and then we then we got that extended part of Friday evening service before uh, Barcho in the Ma'ariv section. Um, oh. So things things developed from after 865, but um, before that, people were making up their own, their own um, variations on the theme that was set for them already. Interesting, also, thank you. Oh. Yeah, also people pre-printing press in the 1400s, there weren't that many copies of Cedarim 
um, because you had to write everything up by hand. So, so often a synagogue would only have one copy that the reader would use um, and everybody else would you know, do their best. Um, that's one reason why there's a repetition of the Amidah um, so that the official words were being said after everybody had their own, their own uh, conversations with God and their, their prayers on the themes of the Amidah. All right, thank you. Yeah. yeah. All right, going back to the questions. Um, so as has been described, the first three, uh, the first 60% of Adonalam is a transcendent God of the universe. And the last two fifths is a personal God of the individual. Which one, which image resonates with you more or appeals to you more? I like the personal. Mm. Because I mean, that's, um, because again, I think that's what's so rich about Judaism and our liturgy is that, you know, we have personal moment, moments, we have public moments, some are so public, you can't even say them without a minion. So I just think it's beautiful the way it's combined. But if I'm going to have a takeaway, I like taking away the personal, you know, mm. I got it. And it's nice that a donor alum has both of those elements in it. So I think that's significant. Great. Other thoughts? I agree with Don about the personal. Um, I think I've been, as I've been spending more time in services reading the English rather than the, going through the Hebrew that I don't understand, realizing how much of it or how much more it means when it is um, personal because so much is we and the community and um you know it's it's not a, a personal expression um and it i even find myself at times changing things to be i or me and it has a different feel to it mm -hmm. hmm. yeah As, as Norma said earlier, um, the ending especially is, is a very, it's comforting and personal. And I think that why it appeals to many of us that, you know, you're, uh, you don't have to worry about anything because God has your back. Yeah. But that wouldn't happen if he wasn't the universal. Because he was the, if he, the, in a way, the universal appeals to me more because even that, because it includes everybody else, also me. So it's like it's a, it's a win win. Mm. Yep. Even take care of my dog. Mm. Yeah. Other thoughts? David, are you going to go, well, there's not that much time, uh, into particular verses and, and discuss them? Or should we just feel free to bring them up in connection with either that question or another? It's up to you. Um. I don't think I'm likely to go into specifics with the time that we have up. So if there's a, a particular verse that helps you answer that question, go for it. Okay, well, thank you. Um, it's, um, I'm not sure it helps me with that, but maybe actually I, it, it does. Um, it's in verse, well, I, <clears throat> um, yeah, do of Kiruhi. Uh, there we go. Here, thank you. <clears throat> 
18. into his hands, into God's hands. I entrust my spirit. Um, I, I knew that was from the Psalms. I didn't know which Psalm. I looked it up. You know, mm -hmm. It's Psalm 31. Uh, it just changes it from the second person to the third person. It's exactly, I think, otherwise the same. And it's very striking. Um, <clears throat> and um, for a lot of people, may, may, maybe not in, in, in our group here, but for a lot of people, it's, it's a powerful thing because it seems to, uh, because it looks as if it's uh, plagiarized from the Gospel of Luke where Jesus says on the cross, into your hands I commend my spirit. He's just quoting Psalm 31. I shouldn't say he's just doing that, but the way his words are right out of Psalm 31. And mm. he's showing, um, I think, um, a trust for the future, that is for the, uh, 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 for, the, uh, for, the, for the next life, for the resurrection. At least that's the way it's understood in the church. And, and it's very powerful that way to look at it and um, I don't know why he or, or Luke writing the words, whoever, uh, chose that psalm, but it's, it's very powerful. And it picks up on Paul's observation that you need some higher power of control to say in your dying breath, uh, uh, or potentially every breath of ours could be our last, uh, that's it, I have to trust uh, in, into your hands. And those four lines, Phil, are very much like that little prayer that my mother taught me and that Hinda's mother taught her. Absolutely. Those lines, too, towards the end of the prayer remind me of that um, poem. I guess it's spiritually based, Footsteps in the Sand. You know, God carries you during the uh, tr difficult periods of your life. And I think there's a parallel to that in Don't Alone now, now that I look at it. Hmm. You know, it also reminds me of the AA thing, that clients who go to AA, and they say, just turn it over, and, you know, your life, and let God take over, and that's very much where this comes, where that comes from. Mm hmm David, uh, Phil's comment um, about that one particular verse coming from one of the Psalms, are, mm -hmm. are the verses of Adon Alam drawn from other places, like so many, or like, I didn't say so many, but like many of our prayers um, you know, where they draw from other, either places in the Torah or Psalms or whatever, um, and mix them up and yeah. make something new. Um, maybe. Um, I don't know how much of it is, is direct quotes or slightly paraphrased direct quotes um, versus pulling on ideas from the Bible, but not actual quotes versus the author's personal like experience and thoughts. Um, but I can do some investigation and see what I can find. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So one thing that is noteworthy about Adon Alam is that it is also said in the bedtime prayers. Um, there's a whole section called Shema Hamita, the Shema on the bed. Um, and it includes the Shema via Hafta. I believe it includes Hashki Venu. It includes the priestly blessing. Um, and it includes a Donoam. Um, so that puts a different spin on this last half, and for some of us, maybe on the first half as well. Um, and at least for me, adds a layer of meaning to this. Um, certainly because a thousand years ago, people were very much aware that not everybody woke up in the morning. And so if this is something that you're saying, 
you are recognizing as has been referenced with that with that thing in English, um, you're recognizing that I, you go to sleep and you trust God. And when you wake up, you say modani, thanking God for returning your soul, your soul to you. Um, the ancients believed that while you slept, your soul went off and had adventures and that's what you saw in your dreams. And uh, if you were lucky, then it came back in the morning. And if you weren't, well, game over. Um, but we start the day with an attitude of gratitude that we have it back. And that may also be part of why Adonalam was put at the beginning of the weekday morning service as well. Looking ahead, since we're in our last few minutes, there are some more questions for you to consider as you search use. Um, here's the Sephardic version. Um, and then there are musical versions. So Adon Olam was written with four beats per phrase. Adon Olam Asher Malach, Beterem Kol Yetzir Nivra, Le'et Nasa Bechev Sokol, Azai Malach Shemon Kra, and so on through all five verses, uh, which means that it fits with any song written in 4-4 four four as a musical, um, musical indicator. So it's extremely versatile. Um, and it's often set to signature tunes for holidays, such as Maz Tzor. Um, but you can set it to anything. So here are some oh. videos that you can watch on your own. This is a song by Craig Tubman yeah. playing with the end. Beyado of Kiruchi, Beatishan, Beira, Beim Ruchi, Giviati, Adonaili, Beloi Ram, and then an English for setting as well, and those pieces work together. Um, and there's a link if you want to hear them together. Here's another song that plays with the themes of Adonalam. Um, I won't sing it for you because I don't know it well enough, but you're welcome to listen to it yourself. Um, and then here's a set of videos with versions that you may that you might be familiar with already. So the French Sephardic one, and its counterpoint, um, there's one written by Eliezer Gerovich, there's the um, happy repeating tune that some previous people do with uh, pretending to be instruments. And so on. There's the Uzi Chitmin one, um, which you can see a video of them singing in the 70s. Um, shoot, blanking on this. Um, hold on. These will be fun. Uh, that one. Yeah. Um, and then there are other tunes. So here's one of the Park Avenue Synagogue cantor um, doing it to um, Hamilton. Oh. Oh. And so on. Um, here's one from the Abu Yadaya. Jews of Uganda singing it on them. Cool. They don't know well enough to sing for you. Um, here's one from Pitch per from the movie Pitch Perfect. And they do it with the cups as well in the video. Here's one to the Backstreet Boys. Here's a gospel version. Again, I don't know well enough to sing it, but you can listen to it. Um, and here's Rock Around the Clock. And then there's the transliteration. You put that on a sheet you sent to us, right? 
It's that'll all be fun. that'll be fun to listen to. All it's of. all on the seat. <laughs> You're great. Thank you.